Joining me now, Adam Brandon, president of the Great Freedom Works. Okay, Adam, before we get into Janet Yellen, tell me about this Fitch. I've never met this guy. <laughs> so Fitch is a rating agency. They're one of these people who go out there and they take a look at a company or a government and their debt and be like, and they kind of grade it as in you have top of the pile, like, hey, they're going to be able to pay back their bills or they're going to be like some of my old college roommates that I wouldn't loan $5 to and they get junk ratings. So you put that together, the United States has historically had AAA credit ratings, but what Fitch looked at our debt and they're like, I don't know, you know, we're, we're about 10 years from now, we're going to have $50 trillion in debt and they're, and they're giving us a high rating, AA+, plus, but they're looking at all this debt getting piled on, and there doesn't seem to be any, any, any it's not changing anytime soon. So they're saying, hey, United States, we worry you're going to be able to pay back your debt in the future. And that's the warning that they're giving. And uh, this, this is one of the most frustrating parts about the debt talk to me is it's all so inevitable and obvious. I mean, it's not partisan even. It's black and white. It's dollars and nope. cents. At one point in time, we're not going to have enough money to pay the interest on the debt. That's a mathematical fact. It really doesn't matter what your opinion on it is or my opinion on it is. That's, it's in the numbers. And yet there's no indication that we're even going to get a slight reduction in spending ever. Well, that's what I, I always take a lot of heart in the, what the House Freedom Caucus is doing and how they're at least trying to raise the issue and fight and it's amazing that they're even within their own Republican Party. I mean, this is a bipartisan problem that created all of this debt and this spending. And you do have just a handful of folks within the House right now that are like, whoa, 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 we actually need to start lowering our spending rates. We need to start cutting where possible. And you hear numbers that sound big, like $100 billion, but it's not really that big of a number when you look at the 30-some trillion we have. But you have to start somewhere. And there's a lot of threats to the United States, and this one is a threat that's around the corner. It's not today, maybe a few years from now, but, the, but pretty soon we're going to be there. And if we wait until the crisis happens, it may be too late then. And this is how great countries get ruined. It's not some foreign invader. It's that they go broke from the inside and rot from the inside. Uh, will this stop? Do we have any chance to stop it? You know, I know what a better question I think I should probably ask you is I, I think we both know it's not going to stop. What's going to happen the day that bubble, bubble finally pops? The day foreign governments, foreign entities stop saying, no, America, I will not give you another loan to pay for Social Security. What's going to happen here in this country? We have seen previews that this happens around the world. A few years ago, this happened in Greece. And when, Gre when Greece couldn't pay its debts, um, it, 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 the credit ratings came in. What did Greece have to do? Overnight, it has to slash its spending. So instead of adjusting the rate of growth of Social Security from 3% to 2%, you cut Social Security by 30%, 40% overnight. If You've got to keep paying your debts, so we're going to have to continue to pay the interest on our debts. However, you're going to look at all the money we're spending on the military. That's going to have to be reduced overnight. Everything has to be abruptly changed overnight. And then one thing that the, the United States has been so fortunate to have is the status of the dollar as the reserve currency. But if you're in a financial crisis and you lose that ability to have the dollar as the reserve currency, all of a sudden we're going to not be able to issue all of this debt. And so that looks at dramatic overnight cuts, which would lead to an absolute catastrophe and in, 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 in just a massive readjustment. I, I, it's, this is what happened to Argentina. Argentina was a rich country at one point. Now it's an economic basket case. That's what happens. Now, I have a little bit more hope that as a country, we can rise to this occasion and we can start to address our debt situation. But um, I wouldn't hold my breath. I wouldn't hold my... Well, you know what? Hey, we got a golden opportunity right now. We have a GOP house, and we have all these appropriations meetings coming up right now. Surely the GOP is going to be out there cutting spending to make sure we can get back on the fiscal track. Well, that's what you would hope to see happen coming up here in the next several months. Unfortunately, it's probably going to be Republican on Republican arguing because, again, you have, I point to people like Chip Roy of Texas, Congressman Chip Roy. He takes spending so seriously. And uh, we'll just see, like, to me, it makes good politics. Like, let's just be honest with the American people. We've got a real financial crisis. Let's talk to the American people and be like, hey, let's, we got to start to deal with this. Um, 
there's no better time than right now to start to deal with this question. Everyone knows it's true. And, uh, and so you can have this you can have this conversation now or we can continue to pretend that there's nothing. And, hey, after the next election and the election after that, we'll finally start to deal with spending. But, um, you know, we may be done with dealing with spending, but spending's not done with us. And so this is going to come home and eventually it's probably going to be you and me or it's definitely going to be my children. I mean, this is a moral issue to me that you have to start dealing with this problem now. Do you think the voters understand this? at all because the truth is there hasn't been any incentive for republicans to cut spending we know democrats won't republicans don't either because when they spend like drunken sailors the voters will time and time again go back to the booth and vote for the same guy who just voted for the latest trillion dollar bill maybe the voters deserve what's coming the way I look at it is you have to be honest with the voters, and I'm not sure the Washington political class has been honest. When you talk about the spending battles that we're having, look, you got to start talking about entitlements. you got to start talking about a Social Security. You have to start talking about Medicare. You have to start talking about defense. You have to start talking about the ways that we're financing our government. I actually have, in my experience, when I, when I travel around the country meeting with grassroots activists, they want to have this conversation. They want, they care. I, if you, I remember, I was there at the beginning of the, the Tea Party movement. We were having these conversations back then. And I think it's, you got to separate yourself from the hot button politics of the day to this long-term, more sober conversation. And I actually think the politicians that will begin to focus on that long and sober conversation, I think Americans are ready for an adult conversation, an adult debate on how you solve this problem. Because this is, to me, the greatest threat that's coming down to our country. If you want to know how the history books are going to write the demise of the United States, chances are um, we hollow ourselves out and we go broke. Um, we have the opportunity to solve that problem. Adam, I hope we can, I hope we can solve this problem. I, I truly do. But let's, let me ask the ultimate hot button question because you brought it up and then I'll mm -hmm. let you go. Entitlements. Look, everyone, yes. love, everyone loves to say, I want to cut spending, especially Republicans. Cut spending, cut spending. And then you tell that person who's 70 years old, yeah, we're going to have to do something about Social Security. What? That's outrageous. <laughs> Then Social Security and Medicare are like two thirds of the budget. Correct. Well, look, here's the good news on that is that if you start talking to younger voters, they're willing to make some kind of deal or adjustment. And I think I look at my parents, they're in their 80s. They need Social Security and Medicare. We're not going to change the system for those people who depend on it right now. But you start making long term changes. You start looking at what do we do right now that you start to have a tiered system. I mean, it makes no sense to me. We're trying to preserve a system like Social Security when it makes far more sense to put small, younger workers into a system where they get to invest their savings into the stock market. That's going to do so much better for them in the long run. And on things like health care, this is where you got to lean on more innovation. you got to learn, lean on some technology. you got to lean on some disruptions. So it's not that we have no options, and it's not just cut or not to cut. It's just we have to start getting real creative in how you address these problems. And we're not even having that conversation yet.